A very good afternoon to everybody as you're arriving into our space. I hope everything is going well for you. And um, it's really icy, icy cold here in Shore and by Sea. However, it's not as bad as uh, I've just been on the phone to my mum this morning. She's in Durham and she's uh, snowed in. She's got no way out of her house. She was waiting for somebody to come and dig her out. She's 83. So, um, yeah, she sent me a lovely picture that looks gorgeous from the inside looking out. But I wouldn't want to be out there driving on the roads. So here we go. Welcome to um, this really um, interesting webinar that we put together, thanks to our colleagues at APSI. For those who I don't know out there in the world of uh, webinar land, I'm Lethem Green, the Executive Director of PPMA. And uh, we've been putting together a series of uh, information sessions over the past kind of six months or so. And uh, kicking off uh, our key um, series this season, I'm delighted to introduce Mo Baines from APSI, who's going to be sharing with you a fascinating piece of research that's been taking place specifically around local government staff and the impact that it's had on the workforce uh, due to the, uh, the pandemic, what's emerging, the themes which are emerging, and what uh, we have got for you is uh, the full details of the survey that we put onto our website, which you can look after, and also all of the slides that Mo will be sharing today will be available for you to have a look at. So before I kind of hand over for Mo to go through the details, Mo, welcome and thank you for your time. And one thing that I always ask uh, our guests who join us on the programme, I'm going to bounce you here because I didn't uh, prep you for this. It's putting you on the spot, yeah? Is uh, what is the one thing that um, has uh, surprised you about yourself during this period of, uh, well, now we're on to our third lockdown. So what's been, what's been the challenge for you and what's surprised you about yourself? Um, I, I, I think not shouting at the family. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually amazed at how everybody's rubbed along so well. Um, I think the sanity of having a structure to every day and making sure that for at least an hour I get out and I walk in the fresh air. And that seems to have kept me um, sane, as sane as I could be in normal circumstances anyway. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I've, I've surprised myself um, by holding it together. <laughs> Sure. Now, whether that will last in lockdown, the sequel is a different matter. <laughs> yeah, that tip of getting out and getting some fresh air is such an important one. And um, you know, something which I found in terms of my routine, I've actually been doing more. It helps uh, when you have a dog. So it's always a good reason to actually get out there and uh, yeah. enjoy the elements. So thank you for sharing. And with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mo and I'll be back once Mo's finished the presentation to pick up any questions. You've got chat facilities. So if you want to post any questions that emerge during the course of uh, Mo's delivery, pop them into the chat space and I'll pick those up uh, when Mo's finished and we'll, we'll have some debate about the, the content which has been shared. So over to you Mo, thank you so much once thank again. You. Thank you very much, Leighton. Thanks for that lovely introduction. And Grace, if, if you're okay to start uh, sharing the uh, the PowerPoint slides, that would be marvellous. Thank you. Um, so in terms of uh, today's agenda, we wanted to really go through the findings of a survey that we conducted. Uh, so Grace, if you're okay to just uh, skip a couple of slides to the, uh, the start. Thank you. Um, and next one. And next one again. Um, so it was really to discuss in the next slide about the research, why we undertook this, uh, the research. Um, part of the reasoning was that our member authorities and through our WhatsApp groups were reporting at the very start of COVID some workforce issues around confusion about self-isolation measures, confusion about where sickness processes sat within all of this. Um, but as time went on, it became very obvious that our member local authorities uh, were really themselves struggling. Um, we were getting WhatsApp messages popping up at, you know, quite late at night, and it was very clear that managers having gone out and delivered a day's work were then looking at the strategic issues in the evening, you know, what to do about continuation of services, uh, what to do uh, about their frontline staff. Um, so we decided that we would look at this issue of resilience. What is it that was driving these services forward during uh, lockdown? So if we can just go forward a, a slide or two there, please, Grace. So the next slide. Um, in terms of the respondents, 
Um, when we put this survey out, we were fairly amazed to, to receive over 300 respondents right at the, uh, really within a couple of weeks of the survey going out. And we wanted to make sure we got a good spread. So just to reassure you that this was kind of uh, a fair sample, if you like, in terms of the findings, we asked people to describe who they uh, how they would describe themselves. So heads of service, senior managers, supervisors and frontline staff. And we received um, effectively a good spread as you would expect of people that would describe themselves in managerial positions, supervisory positions of frontline staff. But we also received 19% of respondents from uh, the frontline workforce themselves. Um, and usefully for us, 6% of, of uh, council leaders, cabinet members and, and frontline uh, service uh, responsibilities for local councils themselves so a good spread of people and we did want to receive from everybody really their views of what covid had meant to them in terms of workforce matters so next slide please grace um, so in terms of working arrangements during uh, covid um, what we found was that near to 45% had stated that they were home working. Um, however, 35% had said that they actually continued to work in their office or depot. So this perception that everybody was suddenly deployed from home working, what the reality was, the number of people were actually reporting into depots and into offices because their presence was critical to keep those frontline services going. And in fact, over 53% said, that at some point during the pandemic, they had presented quite regularly at their office or depot. Um, now, what this kind of exposes when we analyze the, the responses to this question is that there wasn't a new normal for many of the workers. Um, what the service managers, service supervisors, heads of service directors were experiencing was actually that they were uh, almost hot desking between home and the office and the depot. They were having to respond whilst complying with the guidance about, you know, if you can work from home, you should work from home. But what he also exposed, and this came through in some of the comments, was the emergence of a, a bit of a two tier system. Um, so for those who couldn't work from home, it was predominantly um, blue collar staff that had to be out to empty the bins, to make sure parks were open and safe for users with lots of different guidance coming through. Um, and actually a little bit of resistance between the two where some people were quite comfortable working from home, but directing staff who had to be out there. And if you like putting themselves in the, in the line of fire, they were in the riskier professions from facing to the public. Um, so many managers uh, supervising, managing those services for frontline workers actually found that they felt almost a moral obligation. We will go into the depot. We want to see our staff face to face and we want to make sure that they themselves are complying with what we've put in place for, for health and safety reasons. So actually, this kind of assumption that everybody was cozy and working from home was simply not the case across a lot of uh, frontline services. So next slide, please, Grace. Um, the next aspect that we honed in on was the, the impact of working hours. Um, just before we started today, I was having this discussion with, with Latham. We, we looked in the press last week, the dreadful report about the impact of COVID on NHS staff on excessive working hours. Um, and this isn't to detract from the, the seriousness of that situation in the NHS, but this has also happened in local government, but we haven't had the same kind of public fanfare. We haven't had the same media uh, coverage of, of these issues. So within uh, local government, 70% of respondents said they had worked an increase in hours during the pandemic and one in four reported excessive working hours. Just less than 1% in fact reported uh, a reduction in, in working hours. Now what this reflects is in terms of this new work, um, the health pandemic became on top of the existing day job. Services still had to be delivered, but all of those additional measures, whether it was changing the way services were delivered to make them safer, whether it was ensuring staff had the correct PPE, making sure there was call centre operations, looking after vulnerable families, all of these things piled on top of the day job for local government's uh, frontline services. So services continued in the vast majority of areas, but they were adapted, they were changed, and that actually led to people doing this work on top of uh, the normal day job. 
So we focused in on those additional duties. So next slide, please, uh, Grace. On those additional duties, what we found was that those that were part of the emergency response team, effectively 30%, over 30% found that they had um, additional duties. You might well expect that if they're part of the emergency response team, but actually 25% uh, who were not formally considered part of the emergency response also took on additional work. So collectively, over 55% of respondents had seen this increase in, in workload um, and people had taken on different job roles as well to help with the pandemic. So maybe they had some duties taken off them, but additional duties given or different duties given. Um, now, what does that tell us? Well, it actually says there was almost a universal impact on local government uh, workforce, whether that was from director, chief exec level, dealing with the, you know, the gold command at the very top of the local authority, or actually people literally out doing the frontline service, facing the public who had to operate the services differently. So this universal impact, um, and very few were entirely untouched by the pandemic. In reality, additional duties became something of uh, the norm. So next slide, please, Grace. Um, so we wanted to ask about what does this mean to respondents in terms of their own well-being so so we asked them to give us a, a range of, of, of sentiments here this was when we were trying to get into the emotion uh, uh, the emotional response of the the local government workforce um, the majority reported that on some days they felt okay but on other days they had really bad days thinking about the stresses and strains of the pandemic and that was well over half of the respondents so they were saying you know part of the the responses they put in the comments was you know most days I, I kind of knuckle down I get a, I know what I've got to do I go in I get the job done um but they were very very clear that they had lots of bad days where the the whole impact of the pandemic became um almost in some cases they reported feeling fairly overwhelmed by the uh, the, the responses that they had to do um, and what came through and we'll talk about this a little bit later is that um it was the speed of change constant changing of regulation, constant changing of guidance, um, the emergence of new data and new evidence that meant them, they questioned whether they were doing the right thing. Um, and quite um, alarmingly, um, near to 37% reported feeling mentally exhausted and physical exhaustion um, in, in not far short of a quarter of of people. Now, amongst that cohort of, of respondents, there were some respondents that said, actually, working from home, away from the distractions in an office, they felt slightly better, a bit more focused on, on their work. Um, but the comments, I think, of just a selection here, because actually on each of these questions, we gave the opportunity for people to give us lots and lots of comments about how they were feeling. And, and what we did, we analysed those comments. We took some of that sentiment and we, we pummeled it to see what was coming out. Isolation was a main factor. Um, and then balancing those uh, home working arrangements between homeschooling, uh, working different hours to try and accommodate the requirements of, of family and partners. And in some cases, you know, elderly parents where they were trying to deliver their own food parcels. So all of those things. Um, some reported a lack of support from managers. They felt that communication was a real issue. Communication had died off, which let, led them to feel slightly isolated. What do management expect of me? I'm not sure. Uh, was was one of the questions that uh, one of the comments that came through. And importantly, a lack of public appreciation. Um, what seemed to come through is people said, you know, everybody clapped for carers, everybody clapped for the NHS, but nobody clapped for the people emptying, uh, you know, responsible for making sure the bins were emptied or the parks. Now, I know in some senses, we did see some beautiful, beautiful messages to public service workers. Um, and I think, you know, how far that came through was possibly different for different areas. But what is clear is the sentiment that there was a lack of public appreciation for local government and for the services. I don't, you know, I, I don't think people understood uh, that the, the, you know, the public understood that actually it was councils that were delivering some of these boxes to vulnerable people, that they converted leisure centres to, to have those food parcels made up for people. So, so that sentiment came through quite strongly. So uh, next slide, please, Grace. Um, the other area asked is, you know, that's your views on how you're feeling in terms of health and well-being. What about the health and well-being of colleagues and staff? And this is really, I think, um, 
a really important finding. When we asked, you know, how do you feel um, in terms of concerns about other colleagues or about the staff that you may directly manage or supervise, um, near to 85% reported concerns about the mental well-being of directly managed workforce or colleagues. Um, now, that isn't an accidental figure. You know, we can have margins of errors in terms of survey work. But to get to nearly 85% of people reporting concerns about well-being of colleagues and the workforce at large was really quite uh, an astonishing find. And in terms of, uh, you know, the workforce being at an all time low on mental well-being, again, 50 over 56 percent. This was an all time low figure as far as they could see in terms of how people uh, how how people's mental health was was stacking up. Um, so so really concerning questions there about um, resilience um, and in terms of physical well-being, again, 20 over 28 percent reporting physical well-being concerns. Um, and in some senses, some services simply took longer to do. Uh, you know, they had to separate people out to do things differently. Um, and, you know, literally people being on their feet all day to try and deliver some of these uh, services. And often people who may have worked in teams suddenly loan working. So those things started to come through around physical well-being. Um, conversely, we did find that, that there was quite a large percentage who reported that generally they felt physical well-being was OK. And that contrasted with the, the mental well-being. So one of the things the sentiments again that came through from a range of comments was that the longer the pandemic goes on the worse the situation was um, back in March people were saying this will last six weeks eight weeks we'll be back to normal and I think what's happened with the tiering system with the continuation of lockdown measures is that that impact has become really really uh in, instrumental in this feeling of, of, of mental uh, well-being, uh, going almost unchecked in terms of uh, the volume now that are reporting uh, concerns on that and constant change um, so it was also a feature. So having to readapt services uh, and many said, you know, getting a service up and ready for reopening, for example, a leisure centre, only to find that, you know, three, four weeks later, all your efforts were in vain because the, the service had to close again. Um, so next slide, please, Grace. Um, we then asked about the be what best describes the current feelings or emotions of the workforce. And again, this was around looking at the sentiments of, and the emotions of, of people. Um, and 62% of respondents said, you know, there's a general acceptance. This is where we will be in the near future, the foreseeable future. We're going to have to continue with these different ways of working, with this remote working, uh, working very differently and out with our teams. Um, but effectively, you know, the sentiment there, everybody wanted to move into a post-COVID environment. So people are not um, necessarily um, desperate for a new normal. What was actually coming through is people wanted the old normal. Um, it wasn't a case of necessarily accepting this would be the long term. Um, the uh, light at the end of the tunnel um, was also something people were desperate to see light at the end of the tunnel. That was actually a phrase that came in about a dozen times from different uh, respondents saying that, you know, none of us expected it to last this long and they wanted to see. Now that might improve with the, the great news about the, the rollout of vaccines. So we would hope that that would uh, improve uh, how people are feeling at the moment, one would hope. Um, so next slide, please, Grace. Um, I'll just quickly canter through these, but sickness, absence and COVID-19, what appeared to happen is at the start of the pandemic, there was a lot of misunderstanding about what self-isolation really meant. Uh, would somebody who was living with somebody who was shielding also have to shield misunderstanding about how the regulations ought to be applied? Um, or almost a kind of a hyper approach of, you know, if there is any uh, reason whatsoever that people should not report to work, then we have to err on the side of caution. People wouldn't go in. So at the very start of lockdown, um, people were reporting that we saw quite steep curves in people being off sick or self-isolating. Um, however, that seemed to filter down 
once there was an awareness of what the regulations were and sensible management and return to sort of COVID secure working arrangements. So things like uh, a driver or, on a refuse truck with the load is following in separate vehicles to make sure that you were effectively keeping people in bubbles, you were not putting people at risk with close proximity working. So once those kind of measures came in, um, the need for self-isolation, the absences seemed to, to reduce. So it was kind of a peak at the start that tapered off. I think the issue here uh, was also that, you know, during the summer, good weather, a bit of a feel-good a feel good factor, uh, people could get out in the fresh air, you know. So there was this kind of we're all in it together uh, back in, in March, April, May. What seems to have happened as, as this has gone on, the longer it's gone on, is that there is now a fear that with this, you know, second surge, lockdown, the sequel, whatever we call it, um, that actually we will see a return to some of those high figures. And obviously with the latest uh, highly transmissible variant, uh, there is a fear kicking in now with managers that we might actually see um, a return to uh, you know, more positive test months, the workforce and a need for self-isolation um, increasing as, of course, the, the numbers increase. So in some senses, it takes us back on that curve, back to those figures we saw in March. So it would be interesting to see if that does actually filter through in the data. Um, but the general sentiment was that, you know, effectively, public sector managers uh, from an initial rocky start manage the situation probably better actually than other, other sectors. And I think in part that was a tribute to the fact that there's sharing of good practice amongst uh, public sector managers um, about what makes for sensible responses. Um, next slide, please, Grace. Uh, we just cantering through, we asked, what has the pandemic made you think about? So, so this question of resilience, this question of, you know, do I see my future in, in local governments? Well, near to 50% of respondents reported they didn't feel the public understood the importance of the services they provided. 34% uh, said they felt undervalued. Um, 37% said, although they were proud to, to work in local government, the pandemic response had made them actually want to stay in public services. Um, and then in terms of a, a quarter of respondents, this is quite alarming. They said they would be minded to take early retirement or redundancy. So people actually using this to reconsider uh, whether or not they're, that, you know, that it was time to take an early bath almost, you know, shall we, shall we see that, you know, this hard approach this hard work of the last few months has just been you know the the, the straw that broke the camel's back and people uh, wanting to 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 move uh, move on and again 12 percent reporting that they were rethinking career choices perhaps considering a move away uh, from local governments so next slide please grace um so on this issue of you know, how did people feel? We wanted to look again at, at, at sentiment and emotion. And for some, the response that local government has provided in terms of the pandemic, they, they are saying very clearly, it's reminded them of the importance of local government in a crisis, um, the importance of supporting people, keeping local people safe. And what was coming through here is local government at that community level, understanding communities, being able to be very, very responsive to, to local need. Um, and that actually made people feel very, very proud. Um, others, however, very clearly, and this, this hashtag came through again well over a dozen times, the announcement of the public sector pay freeze uh, with the exclusion of, of, of doctors and nurses was, was seen as a bit of a kick in the teeth. Numerous responses used that public sector pay freeze hashtag in their responses. And they said, you know, we've continued to deliver these services throughout the pandemic. Why are we targeted? Um, and again, and people caveated this, but that, that sentiment at the end there, a significant amount of attention is given to NHS and the care sector. And those in local government providing essential frontline services are not recognised in the same way. Every single respondent to that was very, very clear that they didn't begrudge the NHS and the care sector getting those accolades. They, you know, they themselves shared those those uh, those accolades, and many said, you know, I too was out on the doorstep clapping and banging my pans. But what about us? 
so it was that kind of sentiment that after all of this effort to then announce the public sector pay freeze, it really felt like a, a kick in the teeth. And that was, a, again, some wording that came through several times in terms of how people felt. Um, so next slide, please, Grace. So morale was the, uh, the next question we'd asked, one of the final questions, in fact. Um, and again, what we found this correlated very much to the earlier questions when we asked about mental well-being. So uh, people reporting morale was very low, uh, was, was nearer to the 50% mark with those reporting that morale was kind of okay. Um, but we did have near to 10% reporting morale was extremely low. Um, so this correlates back to that consistency with the sentiments about when we asked about people feeling uh, valued, in the, in the job, in the services that they provided. And it is this, this, I suppose, coming through quite a lot in terms of this resilience issue is people would perhaps feel a bit more supported if they felt what they were doing was appreciated. So those long hours and those feelings of, you know, stress and frustration about the never ending um, pressures on services and then on, on job roles, they would probably feel a little bit better if they felt that, that you know, people out there appreciated people a bit better. So that morale issue um, is coming through strongly. And then uh, last slide, please, um, Grace. So the, the key questions that I just wanted to throw out there before we hand back to Latham, you know, what came through is, are we doing enough as a sector to support the front line? Um, there are the potential dangers here that we walk into a one tier solution for multiple tier problems. Sorry to use the term tier here. I think we've all had enough of tiers of different sorts, but effectively um, differences between the blue collar workforce, the white collar workforce, also the age and home circumstances, you know, younger workers who might be sharing houses almost still in student style accommodation uh, without necessarily having a decent desk to work from uh, blue collar going out there you know being at the front line um, but you know how well are they supported if there is not necessarily the management support visibly um, in their sort of depots and, and workplaces and again you know in many services that hasn't been the case there has been uh, there have, have been managers turning up to to make sure people are, are, are safe at work in those in those frontline services but the different circumstances of different elements of the workforce has been an issue it's not this kind of one size uh, fits all and also you know are we defending local government staff enough and are we celebrating what they do enough um so so that came through what could or should we do differently you know i'd be guided by your comments on on that uh, some of the things suggested in the survey was improvements in communication and um, that they felt that in action sometimes, you know, actions needed to be quicker to rectify problems that people ran into. Um, and how do we now turn around the mental health and, and morale issues that are filtering throughout the workforce? Because even with the vaccine rollout now, what we do know is that this thing isn't going away anytime soon. So, and even when we do get back to some kind of, of normality, there is certainly the prospect that these kind of situations will hit us again in the future. Um, and what lessons can we learn uh, to, to make this uh, effectively more effective in the, in the future in terms of how we support the workforce? So I'll stop there. Um, I think the next slide is handing back to Latham, Grace. So I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll hand back to Latham. Thank you. Mo, thank you so much for um, that uh, really insightful and very useful um, survey. It's a question that's come in from Steve, Steve Davis, our president of PPMA, and was just asking, um, in terms of the respondents, were they, was it a national spread that you received, or was it a, did they tend to be concentrated in a particular region? So that's part of the question. Yeah, it was, uh, it was UK wide. So we filtered responses with England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And on a rough cut basis, it, it was reflective of, of those particular uh, administrative areas. Um, in terms of the English responses from the English regions, probably slightly more responses from the north followed by the south uh, and then the Midlands. So it was a good 
demographic spread. And as I say, it did reflect the four administrations. Um, we did play about with some filtering on that. We didn't see any discernible differences between the different administrations in terms of the, the sentiment issues amongst the workforce. So it was quite universal across the UK in terms of how respondents felt. It wasn't that this was a particular issue in the North or a particular issue in Northern right. Ireland, for example. And what about the um, closing date of the survey? When when did it open and how long did it run and what was the, 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 the shutdown date? Yes, we opened it at the beginning of November. It ran for just under four weeks. We let it run. We did a further reminder, but the majority of the responses, probably about 80% of the responses came through in the first uh, two weeks of, of November and then the rest of the responses the third week in November and then the analysis took place in December. Um, it'd be perhaps interesting to run it again now we're into this particular lockdown to see if there's been a shift in sentiment, whether things have worsened or, or, or made better. Um, I suspect it, it wouldn't be made better yeah. by a further lockdown. Yeah. I mean, it gives you a great uh, reflection really of the the eight or nine months that we experienced certainly through 2020, isn't it? Um, before we started to get into this third, third lockdown. And a uh, question from, um, Sue, it's just in terms of the Sue Williams. Thank you, Sue. Um, we, uh, can we have a copy of the, the full results? And I think we've, we're going to have a link to the, the full document, uh, your full report, aren't we, Mo? That yes. We'll on the website. Yeah, no problem at all with that. There is a full briefing, Sue. So we'll make sure we'll share that, obviously, with the PPMA um, and we'll make sure that's, a, that's available because it does create a quite a good analytical uh, exercise there, particularly the comments, which I think flesh out some of the dry yeah. statistics. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know whether you, um, you've got this within the, the full um, report itself, but one thing that's been emerging over recent months, and we've certainly seen this through the report of the um, uh, King's College and the, um, the Association of um, Women in Higher Education Network, uh, of the impact of, uh, on mental health specifically for women and how uh, women have been affected um, proportionately more than men in their mental health and well-being. Was anything, uh, did anything emerge for you in your survey? We didn't do a segmentation on gender. Um, okay. And that I think was probably a mistake. It would be useful to, to do that exercise. I think what came through in some of the sentiments was that the, some of the balances on homeschooling had fallen disproportionately on women uh, workers and only last week if you remember the TUC issued a call to uh, for greater support um, for for women working from home for example that were now faced with school closures and those frightening figures in terms of the refusal for furlough now I'm slightly um, contested myself on that because does that mean it's just down to women uh, to take furlough and you know so I think there are some contestable areas in terms of that whole issue um, but certainly what we do know generally in employment terms is that you know we have a lot of people that would class themselves as the sandwich generation looking after younger children and elderly parents and finding that they're constantly trying to balance uh, work with these competing priorities so certainly you can only imagine that that would be significantly worse in terms of the, the current uh, lockdown measures. And the school closures, again, was a, a fairly contested area because, of course, there is absolutely right to bear in mind the safety of the workforce and the safety of, of, of children who were taking things back to elderly parents and that school closure was a really really uh, difficult decision to to be made but again the impact of that is felt more acutely um, potentially on women um, so we didn't cover it by gender but I think in future surveys we probably should. Yeah, um, yeah. The other area that we didn't cover, um, again, was segmentation to look at the issue um, of uh, equalities from a, a BAME perspective, because again, what we do know from the data emerging uh, in the pandemic uh, was the impact on BAME communities of the virus itself. But how has that actually translated um, in terms of the impact on those issues around uh, workforce and people presenting to work self-isolation, how well have they been supported? So I think there's a lot more work that could be done um, on those specific areas. Mm. And there's an interesting comment from Caroline B here um, and sharing that uh, three surveys 
have been undertaken in her organization. Um, and the results were kind of um, driven by what was happening in the national conditions at the time. And appreciation was something that didn't seem to, to appear uh, when people were providing with some you know, negative responses or, or issues. So what, do, you do you think the response in terms of the lack of appreciation relates to a national perspective rather than what was going on in terms of appreciating being appreciated within their own organization or their own community. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was a reflection of, of a national appreciation. Um, in terms of the sentiments that filtered through, the issue of support and communication was a localized issue. You know, how they felt their particular line management arrangements were, how they felt communicated uh, with in terms of the, the sort of workforce bubbles and what was expected of them, and even political direction, you know, what did the council expect the teams to be delivering? So uh, things coming through to say that, you know, many councillors wanted to see services get back to some level of normal delivery um, and a lack of understanding that actually resources were being uh, tied up into the pandemic response. So normality on service delivery was not possible. The appreciation issue definitely, I think, reflects a more national sentiment in terms of whether or not people felt um, that the, the public understood that councils were at the forefront of pandemic responses. And, and that separation, even with public health, you know, the, the press talks about public health England. Do people appreciate the public health directors that are on the, you know, the TV saying, this is what we do in our local area? Do people even appreciate that that sits within a local authority uh, context? And, and arguably the answer to that is no. And I think it, this goes back for many, many years, way before the pandemic where there is this real difficulty in the public actually understanding what councils do. They may understand that councils repair potholes or empty bins, but do they understand the role in supporting vulnerable people? Do they understand the role in terms of housing support and homelessness measures? You know, and in terms of the pandemic response, you know, the huge pressure to deliver services for vulnerable children, to continue to protect uh, older people, even the role in terms of whether direct provision of social care or whether they are actually commission agents, but the protection of older people. So all of those things, um, the public doesn't necessarily anchor to local authorities, to local government. And I think that's where this lack of appreciation is, is perhaps feeding through into to people going you know why are we bothering because nobody knows what we do or appreciates what we do. So in, in terms of uh, conversations at APSI and your role there as uh, you know, dealing with comms what have you been thinking about in terms of um, what and how and who uh, needs to shift and change to elevate the sense of appreciation nationally? Well, we, we, um, we for Axis part, uh, at Christmas did something really nice and innovative for our councils. We, we commissioned the, uh, the poet, uh, Tony Walsh, who did a wonderful tribute to local authorities. Um, and it was the first time, I think, that anything had had that resonance where people felt, actually, somebody understands what it is we do. And it was a bit of a thank you. Um, we received about 17,000 YouTube views of, of Tony's uh, poem. What I'd like to do is translate that poem into real understanding amongst the public about those uh, really important frontline services that councils uh, deliver. I think the problem we've got is local government isn't sexy. It's not sexy to the, the press, uh, you know, to national newspapers, to national TV. Local government gets coverage in the press uh, generally if, if we are in for a kicking it doesn't get coverage for the good things that, that councils actually do. So, um, you know, and the, it's that old adage, isn't it, that positive news is never a good story. Um, so I think what we need to do is try and turn that positivity um, into something that actually is media, media worthy um, and try and get that level of appreciation um, for local government that simply, you know, it isn't there. It's always there for the NHS and certainly not there for, for local councils whether we have some kind of joint working campaign between all the different local government organisations and, and obviously with PPMA, it would be really helpful to perhaps think about how we do that in the future. Yeah, I mean, we have got some you know, great stories and amazing um, acts of compassion and kindness, which has been 
kind of on display right through the last you know 12 months um and what's you know we need to be able to do is translate that so that people do hear those more you know and i certainly you know just from my own local region you know you turn on the television and uh, you know that sense of what the caring community have been doing the refuse collectors i mean many of them have really got you know there's and these would be right across the country aren't they but being able to turn up the volume of that so people recognize who they are and where they're from and that kind of supporting of local government to their local communities because there's been some really super heroic um, acts of kindness and compassion um, and people going above and beyond which is really inspirational stuff so how do we do that i think is a, a good challenge for us all and a great uh, comment in the the chat space from richard richard brown you know in terms of the employee base of course you know we all struggle with that you know there's no one size fits all kind of solution to many of the challenges people are facing and your comment which i think again is often lost on many is that for many employees in local government you know it wasn't different because they are out there delivering their their business as usual you know perhaps for some support functions um it was a different world who had been office-based who were therefore working from home um, and what will that look like in the future? You know, for many, it's still business as usual. So that's an interesting question. And, um, you know, also uh, some of the comments here from um, Steve and just in terms of, you know, the NHS appreciation is very generic, isn't it? You know, we know, we know that there's lots of um, NHS staff, you know, delivering great services, but few critical services, um, you know, in the NHS have, have uh, uh, you know, have the you know can become you know are still recognized but the, the stuff that we do in local government often gets kind of uh left to one side in terms of how that kind of uh, partnership working takes place to make these things happen yeah there's a great article i noticed uh this morning uh it was on bbc breakfast you know which again is a local government response you know, and setting up an emergency um more tree you know, in one of the uh, local government buildings i mean there's great teamwork which takes place um, and being able to celebrate that is so important for us. One thing that we're going to be doing in PPMA next week is launching our um, Excellence Awards to allow people to share their great news stories because we've had you know, masses amounts of innovation and creativity and people responding really swiftly and nimbly to the challenge that we've faced. Uh, so hopefully we'll start to be able to gather some of those uh, good news stories through and uh, hopefully people will uh, not be bashed for in terms of being able to spend a bit of time and sharing, because that's so important for people to get their story out there so we can actually start doing some promotion. Yeah, abso absolutely agree with that, Latham. And, and going back to, to your comments about the emergency mortuaries, again, one of the areas that hasn't been effectively celebrated is th throughout the pandemic, we have seen that rise in, in uh, deaths really tragically, but bereavement services have continued and they've had to continue and work very differently to ensure bereaved families could bury their, or cremate their loved ones. It's meant huge changes in that particular service. And yet, you know, rarely, rarely gets a mention in terms of, of, of the press. Um, and, and a heartwarming one, um, and again, on one of the, uh, the responses that we have to the survey. In terms of how staff themselves felt and how staff themselves reacted, um, we asked a question around, you know, PPE and, you know, those sorts of provisions, what we had to do differently. And one bereavement services manager reported that they'd asked their staff in line with the guidance, you know, to make sure when they were graveside, they needed to put their masks on, even when the, the coffin was was uh, being uh, uh, you know disposed of they had to wear their masks to ensure safety because they were around funeral directors and these guys that were effectively grave diggers were heartbroken with that instruction because they said this will look really disrespectful to the families and that was because for them their job is with dignity to bury the dead and yet you know never do they get a mention in terms of the the, the whole media narrative out there. So I think, you know, I really welcome your excellence awards. I think that's a fantastic idea to share best practice and, and to celebrate that actually, you know, we have a group of, of intelligent, compassionate people delivering frontline public services and they should be celebrated. It needs to go beyond 
the narrative that we see in the, the media each uh, each and every day. It needs to actually celebrate some of those people in, in other areas of the public sector. Well, thank you so much, Mo. And uh, there's a great comment in a chat from Sarah Durden. I don't know where Sarah is from, um, but re referencing three wellbeing surveys, which they've uh, carried out during the pandemic and um, showing a decline in mental health for men more than women, which um, you know is interesting. And those with a disability and for office-based workers opposed to the dispersed frontline workers. So um, I'm sure there'll be lots more that we'll pick up. So what's next? My final question for you, what's next in terms of uh, you know the survey, the survey results and what, how is it going to be used? Well, certainly from our perspective, we want to build on this to see perhaps if we take it to the next level in terms of maybe getting some further roundtables together to look at actually what are the practical measures we can do. So going back to that set of questions a, a few moments ago, um, what can we practically do now to share best practice and advice? And some of the things, and again, this is in the briefing and the, the, the analysis of that, what can we do to actually support people supporting their workforce? Um, so those good practice guides around how to better communicate, the responsiveness, the I suppose the, the well-being checks, you know, that call into the staff, whether that's a weekly basis, um, the 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 celebration of teams out with formal work is also something that's come through quite strongly as a good way of supporting staff that we treat people as people, not as the commodity. So it's not about their well-being as an employee, but about their well-being as a person. So all of those good practice things we'd like to see how we take those forward uh, with roundtables, using the expertise of people within PPMA um, about sharing some of that best practice. So I hope that we can we can perhaps do this again, um, but do it maybe as a best practice roundtable where we can share some of those uh, those things that make for uh, better ways of, of, of supporting and, and celebrating frontline staff. So hopefully this is the beginning, uh, not the end. Mm. Thank you so much. And uh, once huge thanks to colleagues uh, back at APSI uh, for, for undertaking the survey and also for, for sharing. I uh, wish you well for the weekend and uh, look forward to our next uh, bit of work together and uh, taking this to the next level. To all of you out there, thank you for tuning in. And uh, just a reminder for next week, we're launching the PPMA uh, Excellence Awards on Wednesday. So you can uh, tune into the link and uh, we'll be doing our live launch. And uh, also on Friday, we've got our second um, uh, webinar in a series with Penna, um, inviting some uh, chief execs and people from their aspiring chief executive program. It was amazing the last session that we did with them, real insightful stuff about um, kind of the challenges for uh, senior leadership throughout the pandemic. It was, it was brilliant. So I really urge you to tune into that and find out what's been going on. And uh, in the meantime, I wish you all well. Stay safe and look after yourself and be kind to one another and hopefully see you soon next week. Bye for now, everybody.